curious when you talk about the legal and the regulatory side. Mm -hmm. So actually engaging with the regulator. Right? Yeah. Um, I'm sure going to them and saying, this is a gray area and we want to solve for it. Yeah. Um, what's that conversation? How did that start? How did that go? And what was that whole kind of journey with the, with the regulatory side of things too? Yeah, I mean, I think it was, it was great. It was a great experience because, again, we were trying to solve for a problem that everyone was trying to solve. And do you really want regulators solving for something? They don't understand the insurance business of what is possible and what is not. And so we did, and the TNC knew what they wanted. So if we could work together to address both sides, the regulator was like, fantastic. You guys are on, you're, you guys are on board with it? Great, all the carriers are on board with it. The AIA is on board, fantastic. So you've solved our problem and you guys are gonna build products for this. And now we can put this in the market and we can stop getting all these headaches and all these people writing to the to the state and saying, I want this in my state, I want this in my state. So we were solving a problem for them. So much so, the state of California, when we launched, um, we launched, they had a press conference. First time they had a press conference, we did this in LA. And the, um, the head of the DOI came and and we had like 30 cameras because and he was showing this as how innovation can work with legacy companies in solving for what the consumer demands were what a great thing that's that's what we looked at and you know before i came when i left insurance that was one of the other things that we were looking at not only you know you have for example airbnb you have home share that's another one how does that exactly work because they're it, how clear is that in the policy and do we want to add that and what's happening and so as we looked at these disruptors it was in saying hey have you thought about insurance and you know in many instances we had gone early in saying hey you might want to think about insurance because there's implications in xyz and at the time they were in growth mode and so they were like yeah 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 we'll get to it yeah 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 it doesn't matter yeah 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 and now many of these companies that have expanded and grown they're now taking a, a second take and being like, you know what, that insurance, it was kind of important. We should kind of look at it because it's now one of the most expensive parts of their book. And they're looking at how do they become smarter about it? How do they structure it a different way? How do they educate their consumers? How do they take some of that risk off? And it's becoming uh, you know, a bigger portion of their book. So as we see some of these you know, scooter programs and electric bikes and all of that, and it's, it's very similar to the dynamic that happened I think with rideshare and that it's like okay create the demand the demand the demand and then it's like what are you going to do with the insurance we'll figure that out well you might want to figure that out sooner than, than yeah. later but and, and and did they then take what you did in california and roll that out to the other states yeah i mean we we launched we originally launched in colorado that was our first state that was the first state that passed the law so we launched in february of 2015 and then we launched in california in may in May of 2015 and then in that year I think there were 15 states or 18 states that adopted the same language the same structure so the adoption by the states happened really quickly and again if you think about it that happened in three months in three months that we got TNCs all carriers AIA all the trades to come on board that's a feat and you know I think that in one of the reasons that it did expand so fast is that there was a regulatory structure that allowed for products to be built and then for consumers to feel the safety of having a product there and um you know and we are where we are so it's really exciting to have been part of that and help develop it and see it grow and um yeah that's awesome anyone else have any questions on the uber experience because i'm going to jump to another section of the incumbent side before i want to see if anyone else has any questions cool um so I, I'm not sure exactly the structure of farmers, but in the past carriers that I've worked in, you kind of have these people that are working on innovation stuff, yep. which is like the cool kids uh, that get to like work on like the new and exciting things, and then everyone else is working on BAU, yeah. business as usual stuff. Yeah. Um, did farmers have the same uh, the same kind of structure, and, and if so, well, did they? Have that kind of same that, that you guys were working on your innovation things and then other people were working on the the regular stuff so to speak yeah i mean i think that you have innovation throughout a company in all parts of the company 
So even though we had like individuals, and again, really small team, but it was individuals that were focused on innovation, more on disruptive innovation. On um, so not looking at like operational efficiencies. The operational efficiencies innovation was throughout the business. But we did have a group that was more focused in going to like um, you know conferences and meeting with startups and going to plug and play and working with VCs and all of that. So certainly, and about thinking about the next products. And so. You know, one of the things is that you have to get buy-in from the business. So a lot of the times when you have these groups that are separated, what can happen is that you can create a pilot and then the pilot never gets wings. Has anyone experienced that? A little bit, huh? It's hard because it's such a great idea and you're like, why don't they see it? It's so great. And so it's about bringing the business along for that journey and about, you know, who's going who's gonna to have that buy-in and who's going to own it. Because the easiest thing is to say, oh, no, no, you guys, you guys designed it? No. It's not on my roadmap. It's not on my objectives. It's not on my, my P&L that I'm responsible for. So I don't want to take the hit if it doesn't work. And so it's in getting leadership to see that and, and to carve a, a niche out so that it can be embedded back into the business so that they know that they're going to own it or that it's part of their overall goals. So one of the things that, that farmers had done was in putting innovation as a pillar for the company and that the goals for when we launched programs were actually tied into each of those businesses. And so each one in all of the reviews were showing that and expressing that, which then um, helped the company understand it. And it's also really important to get the message out. So sometimes when you have the smaller group, you might be dealing with uh, senior leaders, but then the company, especially in these work I found, the companies you know, that have these organizations that are 80 years, 100 years old, there is a good number of folks throughout the business that are yearning for innovation, that they want to know that the company is doing these things. And that when they hear about programs that you're doing, even conceptualizing, they're like, wow, like we're thinking about those things, we're building those things, that's fantastic. I didn't know, I didn't know that we were so innovative, I didn't know that we were doing these things. And then those are some of the people that raise their hand and they say, you know, I really want to be part of that project. I don't have bandwidth, but I want to be part of it. Those are the ones that you want. You want to get those people because they're the ones that are going to be your biggest cheerleaders and they're going to say, why aren't we doing this? Right? Why aren't we doing this? We should be doing this. How come we have this opportunity and we're not doing it? It's much harder to, to say no when you only have one or two voices versus when you have a hundred voices of people in the business that are saying, we have these opportunities and we're not doing them, why? Let's try, let's test, let's look. And I'm curious actually, even going going back a step too, for those that have been in the industry for a while, Jeff, I know you've been, been around been around for a while in the church. Just shine the light on the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Don't live it. You know, with, with, with insurance, I sometimes make the argument that we've been innovating over the last 100 years. Right. So uh, the company I used to work for was Prudential uh, in the UK. So like the old commercials are like the man from the crew who used to like go around in his little top hat and briefcase and collect premiums from people's homes, right? Yeah. Then all of a sudden they figured out how to actually collect premium without having to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get you get apps that, that agents can use to collect customer data. Yeah. Um, you get online, online applications and e-forms and stuff. So, and then you're always, insurance companies are always like innovating on new products. Right? Yeah. That's been happening for however long insurance has been around. So I'm curious, and again, when, when and since you were with farmers for those 10 years, mm -hmm. what was that kind of inflection point to say, okay, we actually need an innovation team? Like, what were the things that were saying, okay, we've seen the market, we've been innovating this whole time, we've been improving products, we've been improving processes, but now we need innovation. What was, like, why would a company all of a sudden say we need to do an innovation unit or team? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it gets back to, when you're looking at a lens, so a lot of the, a lot of the companies, and farmers included, had, had tenure, you know, very serious tenured folks, right? You have 25 years, 35 years, 45 years, 60 years at the company. 
And so sometimes in looking through that lens and saying, yeah, we're, we're innovating because we're 2% better than last year. That's awesome. But when you look externally and you say, so-and-so just took 10% of share, or they're doing something, or they went, you know, there is a difference between, and this is how you start to shift mindsets of saying, well, we have a process, and the process used to take 30 days, and we've knocked it down to 28. Awesome, so great. And then you have a startup that is saying, okay, your process is 30 days, we're gonna take it down to two or we're going to take it down to five minutes. That's the difference. And how do you start shifting mindsets that it is no longer about what you did internally in your company and what you were comfortable with and about the targets that you set, but what does the consumer expect? And what is the level of standard that you need to provide? And I think that's the bit of shifting mindsets. So when you start thinking about, okay, autonomous cars. So when we started having discussions about autonomous cars, so I recall, four years ago, and I was saying, hey, we need to start thinking about autonomous cars because it's going to have an impact. And many in the room were like, ah, oh, that's 50 years down the road. It will have zero impacts, won't make any kind of thing. And then as the years moved on, it's saying, hold on now. We have to look at it, right? It's the same thing, ride share. Ride share. Who's going to get in somebody else's car? Are you really going to use an app and hop in someone else's car that you don't know? That's not going to take off. People aren't going to use that. How has that changed transportation? How many people have kids or know people who have kids who no longer get a car or a license at 16? Right? When we look at those demographics of like the age of getting a license and we see that those numbers that they're at the lowest levels that they've been in 30 years, right? utilization of ride share increases significantly. So it shifts who's going to own the car, how they're going to use the car, how much time they're going to spend in the car. When it starts saying who's using autonomous driving and how are they then, um, what is going to, who's going to use autonomous driving first? Ride share companies. How is that going to impact driving? When a ride share company uses an autonomous car, the price of ride share from what we see today drops to a third of what it is. The utilization of those cars shifts from you know going more towards upper 90s 85 percent so when you have an autonomous car that's doing rideshare it's an equivalent of let's say six or eight regular cars how is that going to impact insurance now it becomes real because it's no longer that it's 50 years out like waymo just crossed eight million miles i think of driving of autonomous driving I think this is this is a telling concept of like where there's that disconnect is that at CES last year there was a panel and um, the guys from AIG were there and they were talking about a study that they had done with the University of Silicon Valley and they are saying yes yes so we've looked at it and in the next 30 years we're going to see an impact and that's really going to when we're going to see it et cetera, et cetera. and then the gal from the head of safety from Lyft was there she said well you know we sort of have a slightly different intent there because by 2020, we plan on having 80% of our cars being autonomous. Big difference, right? One is saying 30 years out, we're gonna see the other side. And the other one is saying in two years, we want the majority of our fleet to be autonomous. Now, which one is right? We're probably both wrong, but it's gonna happen sooner than I think most people think. And you also see a lot of the studies that say, who's, who's driven in a, in a Tesla? partial autonomy. I recommend all of you try it, but I think that's when you start to see the shifts of what's happening and how it affects insurance. And this is another great example that kind of hits home for a lot of people is that when you used to buy a car, you would go to the dealer and you would buy whatever was there, right? Features were there and you were like, yes, I want that. I bought it. And then the next year car features come out and you say, shoot, I like that feature, but I just bought this car. Ugh, I'm going to have to wait two, three years before I switch it out. Right? And then a Tesla does over the air updates. So that means that today I have a car, it's a four door sedan. How do you price insurance? When it comes off the line, right? Off the line, it's a four door sedan. That's its risk profile. Huh, how does that change with today? Because now with these over the air updates, right? Tesla went from one day four door sedan to then the next day offering autopilot, partial autonomy. Huh, same risk, different risk. Hmm one day to the next. 
one day to the next, you could buy ludicrous mode. Huh. So normal four-door sedan, and now you can be faster than a Lamborghini. Overnight, you can choose that. Same risk, different risk. Do we price that dynamically? No. Do we file that dynamically? No. Huh. Is that 50 years out? No. It is today. And that is just going to get magnified and speed up. And so it's how do we start thinking about, again, getting back to the regulatory. There are regulatory issues with that. How do we address those? How do we do filings that have things that are dynamic? How do we, how do we use VIN numbers to, to capture that kind of information? You know, it, it's all of these things that are just fascinating. I mean, Mary Barra, um, you know, she, she had this quote two years ago, I think, but she said, we're gonna see more change in the next five to 10 years in the auto industry than we've seen in the last 50. And you're seeing that now. So with partial autonomy, as it moves in, partial autonomy is really the scariest. I mean, it's the cleanest when it is, you drive it yourself manually, or it drives itself with no human. Because when you start saying the middle, who wins? You know, Tesla takes the position it's just an enhanced cruise control, that it's not partial autonomy, that the driver has to have full, full, you know, conscious of what they're doing, and they're they're responsible. Volvo takes the other side and says, no, nope, when it's in partial autonomy, it's our liability. We're going to do that. Oh, great. So now you've got different different companies dealing with different things. What's going to happen when? And then you know, you say, okay, it was in partial autonomy mode. Great. And you had an accident when the thing told you that you should take over. Great. Whose liability is that? Is it the cars because they didn't alert you fast enough? Is it the human because you didn't take over fast enough? So many edge cases and so much gray in there that it's going to be, you know, really, really, really interesting for a long time. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, you can see a lot of the carriers, the reinsurers, the industry incumbents are coming on that journey a lot more quicker than the regulators. Yeah. And I was at the NAIC summit a few weeks ago. and some of the questions that were coming from the regulators yeah. were so basic in nature that it's like, holy crap, you know? And, and I mean, it's good that they're asking the questions because at least it shows a level of knowledge, but um, there's this whole concept of, you know, is regulation, is, are all these things gonna be able to keep up with the innovation? I asked that to one of the former state commissioners and he's like, oh, well, regulation should never keep up because then it'll impede innovation. It's like, well, yeah, I, I get that, uh, but it needs to keep up to a certain extent. So if these sort of things that you're talking about happen, then regulation doesn't come in and say, oh, we're just going to shut it down because we don't understand it or, you know, something like that. So I think it's, uh, um, it's an interesting pandemic. Yeah. Was it the new innovation and technology working group? meeting that they broadcast from the NAIC summit? Yeah, the, the, I was part of that as well. That was only started this year by the NAIC? <laughs> well, I know they started a lot. They, they dropped the terms of reference last, last year. Last um, year. And I think they've had a few discussions around it, but I guess because of the nature of how regulation works here and that every state has a different kind of laws and, reg and, and rules around it, the NAIC doesn't set those, right? They have some model laws yeah. that everyone should follow. But it's not like the NAIC is a federal regulator saying, okay, everyone needs to do this. It's the states to say, okay, we're going to adopt this. We're not going to adopt this. We're going to run it like this, run it like that. And I think that makes things a little bit more interesting here in the U.S. as well. Um, I'm just coming, kind of coming back to that market. So I was just surprised that it took them until whether they, they drafted it in 2017 for it to go in effect to 2018 to actually have an innovation. Yeah, I guess they've never really been, um, they've never really had to be equipped with that sort of knowledge, right? They've never had to think about having data scientists on their team or, or people that understand the, the, the various components of predictive models or how autonomous vehicles work. Now they're like, we need to get up to speed now. So I don't know if you should. Same sentiments, or have you seen that kind of? Yeah, no. Stuff? I mean, I think I think we saw it the same. I mean, the same thing that we saw with rideshare. There was there was many many different groups that were started like after rideshare because they were like, what do we do next, and how do we get in front of it? But again, 
you know, when you have a lot of states and there's not clarity and there isn't, you know, folks driving that and then, um, and you have different perspectives from the TNCs and the auto company, now you don't have just TNCs and insurance, you have TNCs, you have, you have auto manufacturers, you have a lot of interested groups that all have different opinions and state and then you have federal law versus state law and it gets quite messy.